When you walk into this room and you go under general anesthesia on this operating room table, your mind is racing. But what are you thinking about? We can't always know for certain because we wipe your memories with the medications that we give. But one thing is for certain, it is not like sleep. In fact, when you're connected to the ventilator here, you're in a medical coma. Your brain is disconnected from your body. And when we monitor your brain, it's as if you're in a deep, almost existential meditative state. You'll learn about what happens to your mind and body in this general anesthesia coma and how your mental health matters and how it can be seriously affected for good or for bad in this altered state of consciousness. This is what your doctors don't tell you about what happens to your body under anesthesia. I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. I've led nearly 10,000 patients through the deep anesthetic state, and I've led hundreds more through IV ketamine infusions, exploring that altered state of consciousness in profoundly healing ways. Because when patients walk into operating rooms like this one, they're cold and hungry because they haven't eaten since midnight. They're anxious. They're literally giving up control of their body that's going to be paralyzed shortly and cut open. They're incredibly vulnerable and they're in survival mode, which is when we don't have control and when we have threats around us. And then we add these powerful medications to the mix. Does this sound familiar? Let me know in the comments below if you've ever had this experience before. Now, these medications can either stimulate your brain or silence it, and it depends on the dose. When we first start at low doses, anesthetics like propofol here, or like the gases that come out of the ventilator behind me, can have a paradoxically activating effect, meaning that we usually think of anesthesia and sedatives as sedating us, but at the low dose, they actually do the opposite. It's a paradox. We believe it's because anesthetics act on the GABA-A receptors in the globus pallidus in the brain and thereby actually increase activity in other parts of the brain. This sounds fascinating, but most patients will never remember this because we're also giving amnestics or medications that will wipe your memories at the same time. But even if you don't psychologically remember what's going on, your body is keeping score. It's because these medications increase alpha activity or clumps of neurons that fire at eight to 12 times a second or eight to 12 hertz. And when we are vulnerable in survival mode and suggestible from the effects of these medications, it allows for a profound positive healing, such as positive affirmations that can decrease our anxiety, decrease our pain when we wake up, decrease the side effects of anesthetics like nausea, it can empower us to overcome challenges and obstacles. Or that same alpha activity might contribute to medical PTSD if our environment promotes that. Or worse pain after we wake up or heightened anxiety. In normal waking consciousness in you and me right now, when we close our eyes, our alpha activity tends to increase. We call it a relaxed alertness. And that begins to first increase a little bit at low doses of anesthesia, and then with higher doses, will actually migrate to the front part of your brain, what we call anteriorization, meaning the anterior part of your head. The alpha activity increases in the anterior part of your head relative to the posterior part of the head as the anesthesia dose increases. So while the alpha activity increases in the anterior part of your brain, it's not communicating with the other parts of your brain. Your brain can be hyperactive in one part, but you're actually slowly losing consciousness. It's like a seizure where parts of your brain fire up like mad, but you might become unconscious. Or it might be like major depression, where there's also increased alpha activity. It's like we're stuck in the same loops of perseveration and rumination, and we're not communicating with the other parts of our brain in a way that lets us hit the brakes on those negative self-thoughts, those limiting self-perceptions. It's an active brain, but an uncoordinated or disorganized brain because the rest of the parts of the brain aren't talking to each other. The most intriguing part is to come. And if you're learning something new, please hit that like button and share with others, especially if you or a loved one is having surgery. And you can always join my exclusive access private Zooms to ask me more personalized questions. The link for that is below. 
This racing mind in parts of your brain but not others has huge implications because another altered state of consciousness also has a similar effect. And that's the pure meditative state or the Zen experiential state. It's what we call mindfulness, meaning non-judgmental awareness. You're having active experiences, but you're taking away the negative self-judgments or those limiting self-perceptions. It's so similar to anesthesia, where your brain is still active in some parts, but it's disconnected from that painful surgical stimulus, like being cut open. Both of these states decouple certain parts of your brain, like the front of your brain, from the other parts. They disconnect from a network that is constantly running when you live your life in autopilot. It's called the default mode network. It's like when you're driving in cruise control down the highway. And if your cruise control is dominated by perseverative and ruminative thoughts of the past or the future or negative self-talk, you can appreciate that if we can disconnect from that default mode network, perhaps there's healing to be found to overcome that stuckness that we're in when we're depressed or anxious or suffering from PTSD. The altered state of consciousness of anesthesia where part of your brain is active but decoupled from other parts of your brain is similar to that Zen experiential non-judgmental state. And this is so important because while I advocate for IV ketamine for depression, anxiety, and other conditions, it shows that there's so many other ways to achieve that deep healing, like that mindfulness, that non-judgmental awareness that we can cultivate without medications, with meditative practices, for example. It shows there are many ways to unblocking our healing, to becoming unstuck. Sometimes we just need to step out of our own way.